and what the objective is to. So um, do we have anyone that wants to help us with this? I can, I can have a go, uh, Mary. This is Dele. Hi, Dele. Yeah, hi. Uh, well, as you know me, um, I'm Dele and um, I've been in the industry for a while now and uh, as a PMO. Um, and I'm trying to cross over to business analyst, but um, um, I'm still on that ladder trying to climb it. But whilst I'm doing that, I recently pick up another PMO role with your support, Mary, and uh, part of the testimony that Timmy gave earlier on, and um, I got the job through you. So yeah, I've had the experience, so I'm just here to learn more and um, being able to have uh, more knowledge uh, as, I, as I journey through the career. Okay. Do we have any other person that wanted to tell us, or I would just go straight to the point? Uh, can, I, can I say something? My name is Francisca, and I have lived in Newton Kings for like three years now, and I haven't worked. I've been looking after my kids, and I want to, you know, I, I'm, I'm from care background, so I've been doing care. I was working with Surrey County Council when I was living in um, Surrey. So then I moved to Newton Kings, and since then I've not worked, and now I want to go back to work. You know, but I don't want to go to the care industry anymore. I want to change career totally. So this is going to be a new experience for me and I'm quite excited about it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Francisca. We have um, Omolola and Adiola. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Omolola. Um, I'm new in the UK. I came into the UK last year. I'm here for my master's in project management. So I'm from the background of finance and accounting. And presently I'm looking to come into the industry and hoping by God's grace at the end of this, I'll be able to find my feet in how to join in project management. At the moment, I'm looking for placement, which is one of my requirements for the master's degree. So I hope at the end of the um, lecture or the talk, I'll be able to find my way. Thank you. Thank you, Mulala. Okay, so uh, just like for Mulala, I just came in. I came in through uh, January admission, and um, I'm also in um, MBA for strategic project management. So, and I have a background in accounting. Uh, so, I've worked in regulation, compliance, control, audits, background that way while I was in Nigeria. So uh, this is a new um, journey for me. So I'm hoping by joining this, I could uh, learn. And also I'm hearing someone saying you helped that place that in your work. I, I really want to work as well, even as a student within the 20 hour limit too. So if I could start this journey, so that's why I joined this. Thank you. Thanks, Adiola. Okay. Um... I think that's it. Um, thank you, everyone. This is not just to, this is not to waste anybody's time, but just to be able to understand the audience and to see how we can come in and help everyone. I have a slide I'm going to share now, and this is just talking about the different PMO roles. So they are. I'm going to share my screen shortly, guys. Can you see my screen? Can now see your screen. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. So um, this is just to encourage everyone. I know PMO is uh, wider. People think it's just about project support or uh, admin role, which it is in its own way. And that is dependent on the level of the PMO in terms of in the organization. And as well as you can learn this PMO role and become a project manager or a scrum master. It's just like, it's a very good stepping stone or you could become a program manager or a PMO lead. It just is a stepping stone or a, a good entrance 
because not much will be expected from you is a good entrance into the project management world and they are never out of work what i meant by that is that because of the involvement that pmo does in a project world it's not something that you do for the first phase of the project and then you go in and then the contract is ended usually the contract is enrolled is um renewed regularly because you are involved from the beginning of the project to the end of the project and you have seen instances where people the project could stand for like a year the in original plan is for the project to be for a year but eventually you see projects going to like five years six years three years four years so it depends on the on the organization and there are a lot of roles so i'm just sharing uh the different roles this one is around 350 to 375 per day and it's just the pmo i think it's a pmo analyst role yeah they just said it's a pmo there's another one that is a pmo analyst as well 280 to 300 per day you have another one contract this one is a permanent position pmo analyst banking you could earn as much as 57000 um there is also another pmo planning between 40 34 to 43 so normally i think salary this pmo consultant one will probably be like a leadership type of pmo and that is about 70 to 90k normally it's um starting salary is around i think 30 something thousand to um as much as 120,000. Um, so today, just to give people idea of what PMO entails. So today the agenda is, I'm gonna stop sharing now. The agenda is to take us through, the, for the people that are very new, uh, the people that are experienced, you pardon us, is just to talk us through the different uh, projects. I'm just gonna share my screen so that we can see the agenda. And then I will talk more on one areas of PMO, which is um, risk. So we're going to talk about the risk. Can you see my screen? Is my screen visible? No, I can't see your screen. Okay, one sec. I'm not so used to sharing screen. Can you see my screen? Is it visible? Yes. There are people yes. Waiting. Okay. All right so um yeah so um the agenda is to yeah the agenda is to provide an overview of what the program management office what do they do why do we need them and then the different project management methodologies so that will be covered in this session and then i'll talk about the different levels of pmo this is based on structure and um yeah, based on the structure in that organization and the maturity of the PMO. And then I will just go over the different areas of uh, PMO area of specialization. This one is where is very key in terms of having the understanding. And then I'll talk about maybe roles and responsibility. And we will take the future sessions in terms of setting up PMO, what are the expected roles, expected skills and career path for PMO. So this is like the awesome overview of the training. And I will start by explaining what the program management office is. So um, program management office is part of the business. And sometimes you could call them as independent BAU. They help the organization to set structure to ensure there is a consistency to support the project management in terms of re required responsibility. Maybe the project manager need support in terms of coordinating meeting, facilitating meeting, uh, taking actions. They help the project management to make their life easier. Project manager, sorry, to make their life easier. In So that's one of the roles of the PMO. They help to implement strategies. They help to uh, ensure that the business objective and strategy is achieved. And I will go to the next slide. The next slide is just talking about why did they set up PMO? What, what did they do? Uh, this is also dependent on the levels of PMO. PMO helped to create a communication. 
they, they help to create communication for senior stakeholders' decision. So what I mean by this is PM will provide holistic view of how the program is, how the project is. So we could have a single project in an organization, maybe it's a small organization. PM will provide decision-making management, this called management information to the senior stakeholders to help them to guide, okay, this project is still viable, it's still justifiable, or these are the highlighted risks that we needed to um, let you know so that you can guide us with direction or decision maybe to stop the project. So PM will provide that avenue in terms of being in, independent and being objective in providing updates, management information to the senior stakeholders. Uh, and at the same time, they help to ensure standardization and consistency with project delivery. What I mean by this is that there are organizations where you have the project managers, one is delivering or is recording reports this way, the other one is recording it the other way. And there isn't a structured approach of how projects should be delivered. PM, when a PMO comes in into this atmosphere, they help to ensure there is a standardized way of how projects should be delivered and the consistency as well. Consistency means they ensure compliance with whatever standard has been set up. So PMOs help the project team or the program management office team to do this. And um, PMO could be an individual, it could be a group of people. All of this is still dependent on the structure that is currently in the organization. Another the thing is they help to develop and implement strategy for effective and efficient program performance. This is around how projects are delivered as well. They help to say, okay, we need to automate this. Maybe it's an approval process that needs to be automated, or maybe the way they are currently recording their risk is something that it's not doable, it's too, uh, the law of work that needed to be done, the law of tax that are required. So PMO coming into implement a strategy to recommend ways that things can be done efficiently and effectively. Maybe they are already doing something in a manual way and PMO can say, oh, these tools will help you to um, make it more better. So these are the reasons why organizations, when they realize that the way their projects are being delivered are not in structured way, they tend to set up a PMO office. And these are some of the things that PMO do. And the last one, so is about improving business process. So this could be for a structured environment, but helping them to maintain operation efficiency as well as continuous improvement. You know, like an example I will give is um, Apple. Apple has, when they set up the Apple phone, uh, I don't use Apple, sorry, everyone, <laughs> people that use Apple. So there is Apple 12, Apple Pro, Apple of that. Those are like improvements that has been done to the initial Apple that was done. So the same way when a PM will join an organization or when a PM is set up in an organization, you tend to they tend to help to improve the current process in terms of operation efficiency and continuous improvement. Do we have any questions so far? Is this clear? Hello? Yes. Yeah, well, it's fine. Ah, okay, sorry. It seems as if I was the only one. To... Okay, I don't know if there's anybody that has got any questions so far. Okay. In the absence of no, oh, the Jifam Lola raised hand. Um, yeah, please go on. Hello. Okay, uh, we're going to talk about what is a project. So for people that are very new here, uh, what is a project? Before you can go for any interview, it is very mandatory. This course might not cover all of the details in terms of the project life cycle or the product life cycle, but it is mandatory for you to note this, that you need to understand what a project is what is a product or project life cycle? How do they go around in terms of from initiation? What are the things that are involved? So I'm just going to go paraphrase in, term, in, in terms of what we're going to talk about in this training. Uh, a project is a way for business to introduce change. That's the simple one. That's the simple 
definition that I will give a project is usually a way for a business to introduce change. And change could be a process, it could be a product. And also projects have different characteristics. They are usually within a time frame. It's either within a there's a there's a definite start and there's a definite ending for it. Sorry, I feel like I'm gonna um <laughs> there's a definite start and there's a definite ending to the uh project and is also um has a budget. So there's a budget to it. There's a there is a quality that is expected, like expected acceptable criteria, acceptable of um product, and is within the scope. An example I will give is um if a customer service, let's say this is a telemarketing or a business organization and they want to improve their customer service, they could introduce to introduce that business um, to improve their customer service, they could introduce something called a project. And that would say, we wanted to identify where we are, where do we want to be? And then there will be a gap analysis to say, okay, this is what are the things that we needed to do. So that's a project on its own, moving from where you are to where you're gonna go. That's an example of a project. It doesn't have to be, five years projects could be for two months it could be for three months it could be for one year it could be for the complex and the big ones they could be for years as a uh, pmo person is very important that you understand the different characteristic of a project projects they are quite very unique they are not the same thing as business as usual they are not the way business runs regularly it's just a means of introducing something new like a change or an improvement or a product. And then I'll go to the next slide, which is talking about the project management. So this is where you come in. Project management is a means of, is, is, is an application of processes. So this is how you apply tools, knowledge, technology to achieve the objective that has been set by the project. You have a project, and let's stick with one example. Let's say we want to improve uh, Apple from Apple 11 to 13 now. That's a project that has been done. And so the skills, the tools, the processes, the techniques, everything that are involved in making sure that we move from Apple 12, Apple 11 to Apple 13, those are some of the things that you would regard as project management that's 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 the managing of that project of moving from apple 11 to apple 13 so it involves methodology involves the skills involves the tools involved to achieve that objective it involves all of those things and they are usually within a time frame within a budget and with they have a deliverable set of deliverables that needs to be delivered at each of those stages and it also involves planning. So moving from Apple 12, uh, 11 to 13, you need to, it, it needs to be, there needs to be planning involved. There needs to be delegation. There needs to be monitoring. There needs to be controlling of all aspects of the project. And also it involves motivating everyone that will be working on the project. So this means that you want to move. What is the initial phase? What are the key things that are required? So project management is, overarching all of this from the beginning to the very end, making sure that everything is in place to make sure that the business objective is delivered. Does that make sense? Do we have any question? So yes, far, thank you. okay. Um, the other one is program. Funny enough, I've been asked this in an interview. Sometimes ago they said, oh, what is the difference between a project and a program or what is the difference between a project and a portfolio so a project is you have a an objective of what you wanted to deliver it, it could be a single objective whereas a program is a multiple project that you are delivering to achieve same objectives so like the apple that we're using as an example now 
to move it from Apple 12 to uh, from Apple 11 to Apple 13. There are a lot of things that are involved in it. They would have to understand, or oh, do we need to increase the camera screen size? Do we need to make the resolution very big? Who are the team that will be coordinating this? Do we need to change the, the texture, the old? How do we do the, the casing or the, the way the, the, the phone should be, should feel the look and feel of the phone. What are the features that we need to, so that could, that could be divided or categorized into different projects, mini projects because, and then there might be a customer engagement as well, customer feedback, that could be a project on its own. So bringing all of them together is a program. So you, you, it wouldn't just be one feature that we wanted to achieve at the end of this. It will be multiple things that we wanted to achieve. But at the same time, the objective, the overall goal is to be able to deliver Apple 11 to Apple 13. That's the business objective. And program management is just a centralized way of managing all of these individual projects rather than doing them as one, but bringing them to life by having a bigger visibility of all the different projects so managing the different projects will help you um we'll, we sorry I'm good. program management is just a way of centralizing how the all individual projects within the program are being delivered to make sure that that objective is being achieved rather than delivering them on an individual basis and then portfolio. Portfolio is a mixture of projects and program. Here now, it's, it's, it's no more within the business objective. It's not a strategic objective. It's a bigger, bigger uh, value. So you could have multiple programs running at the same time and projects that are running as well. All of them bringing them all together will form your portfolio. So you could see you, you have a portfolio office, you have a project office, you have a, um, a program office. Most of the time, a portfolio office are usually like the centralized office that's overarch all of the different projects and the different programs that are happening within the organization. So, you know, in an organization now, they could have uh, this set of um, IT or this retail arm of it. But portfolio office overarch all of this different projects and different program. And portfolio management is almost similar to program management. The only thing is that it has a bigger view. It prioritizes what programs we needed to do. It also helps to authorize and say, okay, we needed this one to go forward or we don't need this one to go forward. And it also helps to manage them and control them. This portfolio is more at the executive level to give them to say, okay, we have this amount of money in the company for this year. This is how much we wanted to do. So portfolio office up to prioritize it to say, okay, this needs to happen. This doesn't need to happen. And also help to manage them and control them. Uh, and then I have this other slide that I just gave you the different um, levels of project management, program management, and what they needed to achieve and their overall objectives. Then we go to the project management methodologies. So there are multiple different project management methodologies. The popular one is the waterfall. And this is just a set of tools or principles that are used to say, this is how we wanted to deliver a project. And as a new person that is joining the organization, maybe as a PMO or a project support person, one of the things they would might want to ask you in an interview will be like, oh, what project methodologies do you know? This is just saying, how did the organization decided that we wanted to deliver our project? And we have we have few of them. One of them is a waterfall. What we have waterfall, we have Agile, we have Prince Two, we have Six Sigma. Six Sigma is almost the same thing as a lane. And I have a link here that I'm going to share to everyone in case you wanted to have an understanding of what it is. You can just read through that link. And the waterfall methodology is just a way of saying a detailed planning of 
each phases of the project. And before the next phase of the project can happen, we have detailed planning of it. We have a lot of things in place. And the first plan, the first stage would not progress to the, to the next stage without it accomplishing the deliverables or the set deliverables that has been set up to, to be done. So waterfall means, you know how water is drawing down in, in, in dam or something. A step needs to, before the next step can start, the initial step or the incubation step needs to be completed before you can progress to the next phase. So that is a waterfall form of a project. And the uh, methodology, I mean, and then agile methodology is a way where the project management team are flexible to deliver minimum viable products in a way that we can be done iteratively. It can be done in um, maybe every fr the frequency. It doesn't have to be fully planned, unlike the peer, unlike the waterfall. Waterfall has a set of processes like okay, this needs to happen before the next one. Whereas in agile, agile just follow principles. They are not very strict on processes. They 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 tend to follow their own way in terms of um, the Agile manifestos and they're a bit flexible. So they wanted to, an example, something I would mention is um, they try to, would I say fail fast? Fail fast means you try this to make sure you have a minimum variable rather than waiting to the end. Waterfall, you wait to the end to see the product. What in Agile, you don't have to wait to the end. You deliver bit by bit of what needs to be done. And within the Agile methodology, we have different uh, framework. Uh, we have Scrum, we have Kanban, we have Extreme Programming, we have Adaptive Project Framework. And um, Scrum is having a self-organizing team that so even as a PMO, once you get into this role, you can function as a scrum master with time based on experience if you choose to go in that career. And it's just self-organizing, helping the project team to deliver iteratively, like every and then helping the project team to deliver iteratively and providing this update to the senior stakeholders. Whereas in Kanban, Kanban is almost similar to, to Scrum, but Kanban provide visibility of what has been done, what needs to be done, what is in progress. So it provides that virtual outlook of how the project is, is progressing. For more details of this, you can go through the link that I'm gonna share in the chat uh, after the session. And the other bit is the Prince 2. So Prince 2 is more like project in controlled environments. And that is popularly known in the UK for people that are in the UK. It's more like following the processes, their teams and their principles to be able to make sure that the project is delivered within a controlled environment. And that project is also tailored to that particular environment. Aside this, um, methodologies there have been a lot of mixed of methodologies right now uh, we have the six sigma six sigma i would say is the lean so this is a way for the project to deliver um for the project team to deliver the project in a more efficient way trying to reduce um waste and re reduce or um monotonous efforts, doing things over and over again. So that's a that's another methodology. But the popular one that is well known is the waterfall, the agile and the French too. And um, because of the way with this COVID and everything now, there's been a lot of mixed of methodologies. We have, um, is it what? Scrum ban, you have Scrum ban, you have Wajal, that's combining waterfall with Agile, combining Scrum and Agile together. The next thing is uh, the levels of PMO. So we have different levels of PMO and this is based on the maturity of the PMO. 
in most of the organizations right now, you will see PMOs that are doing more like a project support or admin sort of roles. These are the type of functional PMO. They do ad hoc PMO because the environment is not yet controlled, is not structured, and there's no standardized process or tool. So it could just be like the organization said, we needed someone to be able to support the project team. And that's like a functional PMO. So the, the level of um, standardization in this area is quite very small. And the, in terms of the processes as well, maybe they're just growing their processes. That's the level one PMO. And then the other one is a support PMO. This one is, um, they have a standardized process, but they don't have the management buy-in. So there could be oversight, there could be non-compliance in these areas, even though there's a tools and there are things that have been put in place, but people might not be compliant in this, but PMO is not coming in to make sure that they are supporting them. The uh, of next level is the organized PMO. This one, they have the standardized way. They have the processes, they have the management, and they coordinate. So this type of PMO, you would see them in a structured environment where they collate across the different programs, across the different portfolios, and provide the information to the senior stakeholders. This is more structured and more rigid compared to um, the first two that I've mentioned. And we have the third one, the fourth one, which is the strategic PMO. So those ones are the PMO that provide metrics to the senior stakeholders. They are the ones that are involved in capacity management. These are the type of PMO that um, in an organization, you have multiple resources. They are the ones that assign resources to the project or to the program. They, they tend to take more of a leadership kind of role rather than the support. They do the support as well, but they also have the leadership disciplinary kind of PMO and prioritize projects as well. These are the type that prioritize projects. Uh, sorry, there's been some comments here. Can you see my screen? Sorry, I'm just seeing question. Okay. Um, is my screen showing you now? Yes, yes, I can see it. Yes. Okay, thank you. So um, the strategic PMO are the ones that provide strategy. They implement ways of how the project should be delivered. You remember at the beginning, I mentioned about um, why PMO are set up. So these are the ones that come in and say, we are prioritizing this project over this project. We are assigning these resources, managing the resources, managing the PMs. So even at this level, they manage the, the PMs in terms of what the PMs should do. They coach the PMs. So they are more strategic into the business objective rather than doing the ad hoc bit of it. And then we have the enterprise PMO. Enterprise PMO, to be honest, are more like the portfolio PMO. They overarch the organization. PMO and they provide process improvement. So it could be like um, the, the program office or the lower level of the PMO in that organization, they have a structured approach, but this enterprise always look for ways to make it a better process, or they always look for means of implementing another continuous improvement, another training for the team, so they are more like they are at the top of the range for the PMO. And this comes with a lot of experience. And in terms of tools as well, the different tools that they use, they are more advanced. And I think you could find most of them as well in some of the banking and the um, insurance companies because they are more advanced. They try to use more, um, more tools. Uh, they... Next thing we're talking about is the PMO area of specialization. Oh, I love this. So you could start as a PMO or as a project support. And if you understand any of this area of specialization, trust me, you can feature as, even if you want to be a business analyst, if you want to be 
a scrum master, if you want to be a program manager, you can comfortably, with your confidence, comfortably, you can comfortably be a pro in this. And PMO is not streamlined. That's one of the reasons why I like it. It's not streamlined to just one area of the project or the program delivery. It's everything. You tend to have your hand in a lot of things, and that brings that gives you a lot of experience. You have experience in how the BA does their job. You have experience in what the PM does. You have experience in exhibition. The only thing is if it's a technical PM or if it's a technical, like a solution access or like a, maybe a test analyst or test person, those ones are just the areas that you might not be able to function in. But any other areas within the project management, once you understand all of this area of specialization, you would be able to um, be, be a pro and earn good money. So these are the ones that we're going to cover in the next uh, sessions. But today I'm going to just focus on raid management. Raid management is about risk. This is very popular in most of the CVs or the job requirements. You will see them asking for knowledge of what is a risk or knowledge of what is issue. Have you been able to do this? So we'll talk about this today to understand what is risk, what is an issue, what is the re responsibility and requirement from the PMO, what is the workflow. And then in uh, subsequent sessions, we'll talk about change management, we'll understand the difference between the business change and the project change management. Uh, we'll talk about project finance, uh, budget. This is also very key. There are some organizations that you will see are requesting for PMO finance because the PMO manages budgets. Depending on the organization, they help to manage the project or the program or the portfolio budget. PMO also can function as a program planner. They help to manage the plan of the projects using the different tools. They also help with the document management. This is where the standardization bit come in, in version control, in setting up tools where the project documentations could be stored and all of that. We'll cover that in also subsequent one. Uh, the other bit is a stage gate. So this is where you, it's more like an assurance. So some roles you will see like an assurance role, a PMO assurance person. This is to ensure that each of the set objectives for the project or for the program are being delivered. And as a PMO, you are like a police person in this role to make sure that what has been uh, defined or agreed is done, is in place. And sometimes some organizations do tend to have external stakeholders. There are some roles that have been in where you have the likes of Accenture, the likes of PwC to come in to provide an assurance to those uh, program or those projects before they can proceed to the next phase. And as a PMO in that role, you come in to coordinate all of the activities and support the program and project management. Uh, we talk about governance. Governance is making sure the right stakeholders, the right frequency, a lot of things. We'll talk about this in our subsequent session. So these are some of the things we will cover. I uh, will go straight without wasting our time to raid management. So in this session, raid management, we talk about what is raid. What does what does that mean? How do you assess and um, assess or score your risk? How do they treat risk management? Uh, what are the governance that involved then tools, reporting, and then what are the required rules and responsibility as a PMO? What part do you play in this role? Does anybody have um, an understanding or can someone help us with a definition of a risk? Sorry, I'm sharing my screen. Definition of a risk. Do we have anyone that wants to give it a try? Can I give you a go? Yes, please. Um, risk is um, something that um, when, you know, during the 
planning of the project is something that you know they foresee can you know be a blocker or something like that to the project something that can stop the project from moving forward i don't yes. know if that makes sense yes it does it does make sense yes do we have another person that wanted to give yeah risk hi my name is alita um so risk is a likelihood of a hazard happening. Um, that's from an, um, an operator's point of view. So most likely from a project manager point of view, it would be the likelihood of a project failing or probably not completing a project, basically. So that's what it's most likely be. Okay, thank you. Do we have another person? So I have people raising their hands, but I think if I'm sharing my... I'm sure, can we all see my screen? Uh, Adiola, yes. you raise your hand. Okay. Okay, I can move this up. All right. Yeah. Sorry? Question before. Oh, okay. What was the question? As you went along, it's getting clearer, though, but the question was that, uh, you know, you had said that uh, a PMO is a department in an organization. Mm -hmm. So I was just thinking that, so does it mean that the company will always have a project? at every point in time for for the role to be relevant. So I was just getting confused at that point. But I think by the time you were talking about areas of specialization, it's getting clearer. Ah, okay. Yes, so there isn't any, very, very few, except maybe startup companies that doesn't have a project. Any business, when you, are, when you start up or when you're starting, you always want to grow bigger. There isn't any business that has started and just remain the way they are. There will always be something they wanted to improve on. There will always be something they wanted to launch. There will be a new product. An example I've given so far is on Apple. Apple started with is the Apple iPhone. We have an iPod. We have MacBook Pro. We have Apple Watch. That's a big organization, but they started from somewhere. So the, uh, any business that has a bigger vision, there will always be a project in it. It might not be that they needed a PMO because they are not big to that extent to afford it. But most times, the big ones, they always want a PMO. They always wanted someone, especially if they notice that there has been, um, there is no justification to how this money was spent. Oh, we gave this uh, program 12 million pounds to spend last month but there wasn't anything done. We can't even see what has been done. Or, or the, we have different ways of recording our risk. Or we have um, this person present this report to the senior stakeholders. It's quite different from the way this other program prevented it, presented it. So when, once there are things like that in an organization, then they realize that there is a need for PMO. PMO come in and be the middle person to support them to collate all of these things so that we don't have a uh, one pma presenting slide in this way the other pmb is presenting slide in another way so pmo person come in as a middle person to present this to, to support this and implement a standardized way of reporting to the senior stakeholders or even it could be in form of template uh, there is someone that said some, uh, Ola, Omolola said, risk is the probability of an event occurring that will affect projects either positively or negatively. That is, everybody is correct. It just depends on where we're coming from. So risk is an event or a condition or anything that could happen. Should, should that thing happen, it would impact on the project delivery. It will impact in one or two of the project objectives. So I have it here. It's very simple and lame and easy to understand. Risk is an uncertain event that may impact project or program or the objectives should it happen. An example of a risk could be, um, we wanted to, we wanted to set, we wanted to, Let's use Apple now, the Apple Pro. We wanted to move that, that's the project, but a risk could be that uh, we do not have enough, there's a risk that we might not get enough engagements to be able to know that this is feasible. 
or the value, the money we're going to, um, maybe the price we wanted to sell it because of the different big features. Uh, someone raised their hand. Olumide. Hi, Olumide. Hello, good morning. Good afternoon. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's morning here in Canada. I'm sorry. Oh, good afternoon. Okay, I wanted to ask that is well taken care of. I wanted to just ask that concerning the, uh, the risk. Is okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I'm just seeing that risk of hand. Thank you. Okay. I knew it. I told you. Ah, uh, my Tony, Tony, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no problem. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, risk is. Uh, yeah, I was talking about the Apple, and it, the, the risk will come in in different form or in different ways. And it's something that every project, for them to, to ensure that we deliver the agreed business objective, they need to take note of us. So I'm saying this, I'm explaining this, not necessarily like as a PMO that you're going to be defining what risk is in an interview or anything, but it's good to have that knowledge of what a red, a red log or a radio is so that when you are in that role or if you are currently in that role, you can be able to ask questions or you can be able to um, ask questions or challenge some of the ways they are raising risk or support the project in terms of how they are recording their risk. So risk is an event or a condition, something that should it happen is going to impact the likely uh, the delivery of the project. And it is a mandatory thing that needs to happen in every project. Uh, and then risk management is the process of identifying the risk, assessing the risk, having a plan in place in form of a mitigation actions to ensure that this risk does not materialize. Or if this risk is going to materialize, it's going to reduce the impact of the risk. So that's the risk management. And that's what we have in this um, first slide here. So risk management is all about identifying that risk. And this is usually done when the project is starting, is done in the workshop. So uh, when they start a project, they usually have like a risk workshop or a raid workshop, where even though they don't have an understanding of the whole overview of what the project is going to deliver, but they start coming together in terms of the different stakeholders. They could be the test manager, solution architect, PMO, project manager, business analyst. All of these people come together and say, okay, we have been um, assigned this project. What are the likely risks that we are going to encounter? Uh, someone is raising and Deji uh, Famalala. Yes, I just wanted to say something about what you said uh, regarding risk. Um, you said they might not, um, it's not likely to, to be asked in an interview. I remember when I started my career, I was <laughs> asked that question, what is the difference between risk and issues? So don't rule that out. Um, that might come up. Another question is, um, I wouldn't know if it's a question. Well, um, somebody uh, defined the risk as um, it could have both negative and uh, positive impact. Uh, sorry, I need to. <laughs> sorry, uh, could you tell us about the uh, positive impact as well? Okay, yeah. So go back. Going back to the first question. All right, I'm going to take that back. You could be asked anything in an interview. The essence of this session is to have some understanding of what it is, and then in your role to know how you will be able to support and help the project or the program team. When you talk about risk happening um, for a positive impact on the project, I think I'll have to come back to that question. But most of the time, the way we record risk are more about the negative. I can, I can call you the positive. Yes, please. Sorry. Yeah. 
Oh, sorry, someone talking. Okay, so on the positive side, it, it, risk isn't all about negative. On the positive, it will help you to understand the issues you might encounter and might delay the project. For instance, if uh, you raise a risk and say, right, uh, we are worried that we will not have enough resources to carry out the project, uh, especially if you are running a sprint or agile project, that would help either the PM or the program manager to quickly look and I mean, raise that risk to maybe the board and say, I need so, so, so and so resource. Because if they don't address that risk now, it would have impact on what they, are, so they have promised to deliver, maybe in a sprint or maybe in a project milestone. So that's the pro positive side of things. Now, once you have identified it, you can quickly uh, raise the mitigation or at least take actions to mitigate the uh, negative impact. I hope that helps. Yes, I think that's, that, that's, that's a good really good. One. Yes. That, that's yes. a good one. Uh, I think I just remember. Another way, okay, sorry. Uh, another way, risk, risk creates opportunities. Yes, that's what uh, I wanted to say. Yeah. It helps to, to be proactive. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, apart from that, if, if you have a company that deals with two products, so having a project in one product can create a market for the other product when, when they see a risk. Take, for example, if, if you have a company that creates kind of people for, for, uh, for snow and you have a big project in Scotland and snow is coming up, snow in that particular time of the year, maybe in December, is a risk. But your your sister company has got a canopy company that can that can bring business for your company. That that risk will create that business for your sister company. That's creating opportunities. So when you are looking at risk, you are looking into the opportunities that this risk might create for your company as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Deji. Who is Thank Deji? you for your. Who is Deji? Deji is the, is my brother. Easy. All right. Yes. Thank you very much for joining and supporting your sister. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think I have someone else. Teslim, are you raising your hand? Uh, yes. Okay. I wanted to like, contribute to like the positive aspect of risk. So, uh, looking at risk is like a two-sided coin and because of the probability it, mm. it can edge more to one side than the other and in terms of risk management is how to prevent it from going to the negative aspect and trying to control it so you land on the positivity sides of it and like a simple way of looking at it is maybe like investing in the stock market yeah, you have the risk of losing your money. And when you do make money, it, you can have like very high profitability. So that's just a simple way of looking at risk. Mm. So there's always a negative and a positive side. Yep, yeah. agreed. Thank you. We have MM. Hi, MM. Do you want to make a contribution? Hi everyone, uh, well done um, uh, Mary and everyone else that's organizing this. It's just uh, uh, to give my two cents on uh, the risk. Um, in terms of positive risk, a good example would be if there was a regulation that was passed and it favored um, a company. It could mean that, you know, just like everyone has chipped in to say that we have opportunity, we have risk, there could be opportunities. Uh, they could be positive, they could be negative. If they're negative, obviously, there are issues. Um, but if they were positive, it would be an opportunity for the company to be able to capitalize on. So it's not always negative. And that example would be like if they passed a regulation or a legislation that favors a company, and that means that they could have more sales come through, or that it means it could create an opportunity for them to be able to have, you know, other projects that could come up or build um, products and services. So that's just my feedback. Thank you, everyone. That's been awesome contribution. Yeah. And we go to the other one. We have assumption. So assumption is also at the beginning of the project, or it could... So risk was maintained throughout the lifestyle of the project, life cycle of the project. 
the same is for assumption. And sometimes assumption is without any evidence, it's just we assume this might happen. We make assumptions, especially when the project is starting out and they needed to make, um, to create some documentation in terms of the project um, initiation document, the PID. They make a lot of assumption because at that stage, they haven't got all the information, all the details that they needed. And sometimes assumption needs to be tracked regularly so that it doesn't become a risk if it's not uh, validated. So, so as the project is progressing, you tend to validate your assumptions via your assumption log to see, okay, is this assumption valid? Is it true or will it become a risk? So that's uh, about assumption, but um, not many organizations tend to follow this through after maybe initial or um, second stages of reviewing it. Um, we have the other one is, we have, we have issues. Do we have, um, is the raising hand or Lumide, are they still raising hand or is this the old one? No, it's the old one. Oh. Ah, right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, and then we have issues as well. So, issue, me, I define issue as a materialized risk. And risk is the probability of something happening, the likelihood of it happening. Whereas an issue is something that has already happened. So, it could be like that risk materialized. Once that risk materialized, it became an issue. Or you could also, you could, it, it might not, it might not be identified as a risk initially. It could just be an issue that just came up because they didn't notice or they didn't know about it ahead of time. So issue is also an event or condition that once it happened, is going to have a negative impact on the project or the program objectives. And Issue management is slightly different to risk management. The reason I say that is issue management involves identifying it, assessing the issue, and prioritizing it to say, okay, is this a big issue? Is this a medium issue? Is this a low issue? And trying to mitigate it, provide mitigation actions in place to make sure that the issue does not escalate beyond what it is, or to provide a mitigation actions in a way that it's lessen the impact of the issue or turn it back to a risk so that the issue doesn't have much impact on the project or the program objectives. And this is maintained as well throughout the life cycle of the project. Uh, the other one is dependency. So dependency is, I have defined it as a logical constraint-based relationship between multiple activities. It could be two or more activities in a project where one is reliant on the successful completion of the other. So a project A is dependent on a project B to finish before it can proceed, which is almost like that waterfall. Or it could be an activities or a tax within the, within the project saying, this tax is reliant on this other tax. Especially people that are very more um, aware of the planning, they, they tend to have this dependency a lot in, in program or project planning. And dependency management is a process of identifying this dependency. And it's also done, most of us are done via workshop, identifying it, assessing it, and managing the dependency to that, that exists between different tax and resources to make sure that the projects delivered to the agreed um, business objectives. Do we have any questions? I'm expecting a lot of questions around this RAID. And at the same time, so we have RAID, that's the popular one. We also have RAIDO. The other bit that is not included in this slide here, I think is in my next few slide, is the decision and as well as the opportunities. So there is always, there is a decision log and there is a opportunity log. And that's why you can see them being called a redo. Do we have any questions on what is a risk, risk management? 
risk um, issue management. People that are new, please feel free to type in your questions or feel free to ask any question. Um, hello, Mary. Many thanks Thank for um, what you've been teaching so far. My question is, do we have a certain template you have for your rates log? Or mm -hmm. can you just generate one or do different companies have what they use or are you supposed to come up with one as a PMO? Um, thank you. Um, I have templates and tools in my few slides back down. Uh, it depends on the organization and how big they are. So, but there are key things that needs to be included in the templates. There is a general thing that is expected in a risk log, in a dependency log or in an assumption log. But there isn't a standardized one. Some companies wanted it very simple, and some companies wanted to not complex, but to have a bigger visibility of their risk log, the impact, and different things. We will look at the live risk log. This is one of the ones that we used during um, the ladder back down uh, migration projects that happened last year. I'm not sure a lot of people are aware. So we have a live risk log that I will be sharing with us today for people to just have a view, a flavor of what it looks like and how it is being used. Uh, the next slide is the risk assessment. So I have put up here a risk matrix. Re is called risk matrix as well as um, a likelihood and impact matrix or likelihood and impact grid and this is a useful tool to identify and assess your risk to know what is the impact of the risk what is the probability of that risk happening so a risk assessment is often referred to as a risk exposure how exposed is the organization or is the project to the risk in terms of understanding what that risk entails and the way risk is being uh, or risk assessment or risk exposure is being calculated is risk likelihood multiplied by risk impact. There are some organizations that have one to three, but most of the time I have been in areas where it is around one to five. That is saying the likelihood of the risk happening is very, 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 very rare. So they'll rate that as one. The likelihood of the risk happening is two, mm, is unlikely. So that could form even in percentages, if you want to categorize it in percentages, because you will see when you join an organization, some of them will have it as in form of percentages. So rare would be zero to 10% of that happening. Uh, two could be unlikely. We don't think that is going to happen and is between 10 and 20 percent like uh, likelihood of that happening. And three is uh, 30 to 40 percent of that happening as well. So there is a probability that is possible for that happening. And they plot the grid to say, OK, even if there is a possibility of that happening, what is the impact of that risk? A risk could have a likelihood of three, but what if the impact of that risk is going to be like four or five? That will move the risk to a very big, um, because of the impact that is going to have should it happen, that will move it to the red zone. Um, I'll just digress here, just because of this picture that we have on the screen here. For the people that are new, um, we usually have something called RAG status. RAG is spelled as R-A-G. You would see it in many things. And that represents red, amber, and green. So you would see in most of the project management reporting, you will see those three colors. You will see the red, you will see the green, you will see the amber. And what that is saying is it's just showing the health status, assessing how healthy or how unhealthy or, or of that project. Or it could be saying, oh, we are on track to deliver, everything is on point, or we are not on track to deliver, or we have a major issue. So when a project is saying they have a major issue, they will probably be putting that status as red. 
And when they're saying, oh, there's a probably, because they've identified one or two risks, they'll probably be putting that status to amber. And when everything is hunky dory is going on well, smoothly, they'll put it mostly in green. So I just thought to explain that briefly before um, going into, so that we understand this picture, what is showing here. So going back to risk likelihood and impact, you could have um, a risk with a probability of three of it happening. So that means it's 50-50. But if the impact of it is negligible, it's not something big, it would just still remain as green. It's not something major. So project management team tend to use this matrix to be able to assess their risk to understand what the impact of the risk is going to be like and what is the likely uh, the the impact of it and the likelihood of it and you will see it as well some people write it as consequences whereas some people write it as impact and the likelihood as well people sometimes call it the probability and you could as well see people mentioning it as a likelihood and in a risk log, we have different risk ratings. We have, um, in, when you're assessing your risk as well, you have different risk rating or different risk. Yeah, risk rating or scoring or assessment. Different, you can use the terms interchangeably. Inherent risk. Inherent risk is, that is the initial risk assessment that we, do, we have done on this risk. So there's a risk that, is going to rain tomorrow and this rain because of the marketing campaign that we already have there's every chance that it will impact that campaign going ahead so that is a risk and we have said oh the probability of it happening is is, go is going to impact our delivery of the marketing campaign which could be uh, impact means we won't be able to do it so that means all the plans everything that's been put together is going to go to waste, we will not be able to get the right audience. So at that stage, we could say the probability of the rain coming is maybe possible 50%. What is the impact of that happening on what we have already planned in terms of the campaign? The impact is the impact is major. So that could be like five or four catastrophic. That means the old session is closed out. And if you look at the matrix here, you probably be rating that as, if it's a major, you probably rate it as 12. So 12 means it's high. Um, sorry for this diagram. Now I'm just looking at it now. The diagram is meant to show us just three colors. We have amber, we have green, and we should have just red. Um, these different shades of amber is just saying how big it is. But some of the organizations that I'm aware of, anything above 10 in their risk assessment, they already ranked it as red. Means That means it's, um, there is unlikely for it to happen, but the impact of it is going to be very high. So they tend to put it as red here. So like the example I was giving before, the marketing campaign, 50-50, percent of it happening so we have already seen that okay that is a possibility which is a three and the impact of it is going to be like four or five this is very extreme that means we won't be able to get the money so in that way when they are updating the risk log they put the inherent risk as 12 and that is, they will show you what is the inherent likelihood of that happening what is the inherent um impact of that risk happening so it is more like before any action is taken, this is the impact that this risk is going to have. And the residual risk, so some company call it residual risk, some call it current risk. This is the risk assessment that has been done after we have put in a mitigation plan in place. So sometimes the inherent risk is fixed because that is what we've done, that's what we've identified, and this is what we've assessed. But after we have putting some mitigation actions in place. Um, we think after a few occasions or few times, this risk might reduce. So some occasions, um, residual risk is often calculated as the risk score 
which is after mitigation action have been put in place, what happened to the risk? Did they reduce the exposure of the risk? Did they reduce the impact of the risk? And this is also being maintained as the continuously review your risk log in the project world. And so that example that I gave within the marketing campaign, they could say, oh, instead of us having it in an open field, which was the original plan where the, um, where the rain is going to come in and stop us, that's that risk of the rain happening. What about if we get a canopy? Or what about if we go into a shopping mall where even though the rain yeah, will just pay some money and put some measures in place so that in case it rains, we can just go in into the shopping mall and pay some people and we'll still be able to do the campaign. So that is like having a mitigation plan or mitigation action in place. and that would reduce the likelihood of the whole event being cancelled and that is where you tend to put in your residual risk score. This is after you've applied your mitigation plan. Sometimes it stays as it is, sometimes it does reduce it. And target risk. Target risk is, oh, we have seen this risk, this is our exposure, this is where it is, but we are hoping that by the time we apply a lot of these different <laughs> by the time we I have a question here I will come back to the question by the time we um, apply a lot of the different mitigation actions this is what we want the risk, risk to look like before we can close the risk or before the end of the project sometimes some projects um, as a project closes some some risk get to close, but some of them get migrated to the business as usual team, the operations team to be able to undo and continuously um, manage. I have a question here. It says, who established the, P the impact of the risk? The PMO analyst or the project manager? So it depends on the structure of the PMO that is currently in that organization. If it's a well-structured environment, yes, the PMO will set the impact of the risk. And what the impact could mean is, is going to impact on the timeline of the project, is going to impact on the... So if you rate a risk as, let's say, 12, what is the impact of it? So the impact could be, we need more money, or the project is going to be delivered more, uh, delayed more, or there's a regulatory problem with it, or it could be the process might be might not go ahead. So in this range, the PMO tend to set the impact based on a structured, well-developed um, environment. But if it's not a developed environment, the project manager can support with the senior stakeholders to define this impact. Does that answer your question? So it, it depends on the structure that is in place before, um, but everybody works together really to, to define that impact. Even as a PMO, when you are setting it up, if you are the PMO person that is setting it up, you need to engage with the different stakeholders that are involved in the organization to be able to make sure that you are getting the right information and understanding the impact of that risk, what it's gonna have. Uh, and is uh, going to update, regular updates, like you frequently updates what the impact may mean. And the impact at the project level is going to be different to the impact at the program level. And this is also going to be different to the impact at a portfolio level. What I meant by this is if there is a security issue now or a security risk that has been raised, there is every probability that the impact of that security risk would not be that major on a project. But if you have multiple projects or even the same project, we have multiple security risks that has been raised, the impact of them happening could have a major if imp um, effect on a program or at the program level. So it changes as the structure is or and as the complexity of the project or how the maturity of the PMO as well. So do we have any more questions? We're almost at the end of today's session. 
Is everybody okay with that risk assessment? Do you have any questions? All right, thank you. Um, hello, Mary, can I ask Hi. if yes, if you I've been training as a BA all this while, but because um, I've not really worked with it. And what I'm doing right now is kind of PMO, even though I'm self-employed. So my sister, she's a BA, she was now saying that I could combine the two and mm -hmm. just learn more about PMO and put that on my CV. But I'm not really sure how that ties together. Is it that you should just focus on risk management or change management or I don't know. It's kind of like a new field to me. Even though I understand projects and the cycle and how it works and everything. Um, okay. That makes sense. So, um, yes, it does make sense. Um, it depends on the maturity of the organization one. And I have been called for roles that wanted everything. Like I should be a BA, I should be a PM or I should be a PM for this one role. So it's good to have um, knowledge of what some of these functions or some of these roles, what they do. And it's also good to have um, experience in them. But for career progression purposes, it would be good to have one that you focus on currently rather than juggling between multiple of them. It okay. would be good to have the experience, yes. Okay. But if you want to grow in career, maybe start as a PMO, as a project support person, and along the way you you engage with the different uh, stakeholders, and that you can say, oh yeah, can you give me some BA, some role? This could be in permanent position too, and um, um, I have knowledge in this. Just putting yourself forward, always saying, oh yeah. I have knowledge, I, I could help you, I could support this. And by that, you can ease e easily into a BA role in, in that mm -hmm. environment. Okay. So you can have it as hybrid. I've seen very few, though, not regularly, uh, oh, right. roles that have hybrid, uh, that they wanted hybrid PMO or BA experience. So it would be a very good thing if you can master them. But okay. for growth, I would say focus on one currently and then ease gradually into the other one. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Do we have any more question? Okay, I will go to the next thing, which is, thank you, Olumide. <laughs> and Ola Inka, thank you. So the next one is risk treatment. How do we treat risk? There could be more, but I'm going to just talk about this few that we have that I have listed here. There are five ways you could treat a risk. You could either avoid the risk. That means you want to avoid any actions or anything that will bring about the risk. So that's a way of treating the risk, the, the organization. So let's say there's a program or there's something in place and they wanted to there's a risk that has been identified. It could be questions will be coming up saying, why, what caused this risk? Why do we have this risk? What is the root cause of it? Is there a way we can avoid that? So once they are able to identify that, the business or the organization can say, okay, yes, we don't want to do the activities if the impact of this risk is this much. So they tend to avoid that risk. Another way of treating the risk is to reduce the impact. So the organization or the project, project, program, portfolio, they identify a risk and they say, um, for us, we really understand this risk and we, would, we cannot af avoid it. The only thing we could do is to reduce the impact of the risk happening. And maybe um, an example I've already given is the campaign, the marketing campaign thing there is a higher chance that it's going to rain, which is like 100% or let's say 70%. And the impact of it is very high. But for, uh, for that impact, to reduce the impact of the risk in a way for us to treat it, 
we are just going to not bother doing it in um in the open plan. We're just gonna go and get a covered environment or somewhere in the in the shopping mall and that reduce the exposure of that risk. So these decisions will be made not by the project manager or by the PMO. It depends on the maturity of the PMO, but it would probably be made by the senior stakeholders when you are reporting your sort of risk to, um, to them. So a way of treating the risk could be to reduce the impact of the risk by putting in the right mitigation actions and following through the mitigation actions. Uh, session, okay. And then um, in the next, we have just about a few more slides and we will end in about 20 minutes, there about or less. The other bit is uh, risk treatment. So another way is this treatment is called tolerate. They tolerate the risk. And this could be like, we accept it. We don't have any choice. So the only way for us is to accept it and we just keep managing it and keep tracking it regularly to be able to um, monitor it and ensure that the impact of it doesn't have, it is lessened or is reduced. So this way the business or the program just say we will tolerate it, we will accept it as is a risk, but we'll continually or regularly monitor, uh, have a view of it or like track it to understand how it's progressing. The other one is transfer the risk. So this could be, this one is very common when you have a third party uh, or an insurance company, they will just be like, um, this risk, there is this risk that we've identified and we should transfer it to the third party. So it happens where there are a lot of um, maybe subcontractors or a contractor is involved in a subcontractor, a contractor is involved in um, in in the program delivery. So some of the program team would say we'll transfer that risk to um, to the third party. An example could be like uh, maybe is a telecommunication and they have a relationship with an insurance company, they can, if there's a risk that has been identified in whatever projects they are doing, they can easily transfer that risk to an insurance company saying that every client or every resources that is coming on, every customer rather, um, the risk of them being exposed, it could be a security risk, is going to be shared by the insurance company. Uh, sorry, is being transferred to the insurance company, which is like transferring the ownership of the risk or the impact of it to third parties. The other one is even if it's um, third parties involved, sharing in between it. So both of them are saying, okay, whatever the impact of this risk, we're going to share it 50 by 50. Uh, so those are the five ways of treating risk. Uh, there could be more. Uh, I am only telling you based on my own experience. And then this one is uh, the risk process flow charts and risk governance. Uh, it's just talking about how risk is being identified. So PMO tend to be involved from the beginning of this to the end of this cycle. And it's just saying they identify when they're having the workshop, the PMO is involved with them when they're assessing the risk in terms of the scoring and everything. The PMO also is involved in that. And PMO helps to document and populate the project risk log. PMO also helps to set up the uh, regular review of the, of, the, of the risk sessions with updated mitigation plans. And um, at the end of it, PMO send out the actions to the individual risk owners to say, okay, you who have this risk and everything. And PMO creates reports as well. So it depends on the maturity, but PMO tend to create some form of report to say, okay, these are the number of risks that we have in the organization. These are the severity of them, um, if they should happen. So there are different form of reports that, uh, that could come as an ad hoc or as a regular dashboard report that a PMO tend to present to the senior stakeholders. And the other one is around the regular tracking or monitoring of those risks. So PMO is involved in making sure that the mitigation actions are still valid, 
uh, they are still being owned by someone. There's someone to talk to. Uh, so that's just the, like a simple layout of the risk process. Risk governance. Go governance is just ensuring that we have the right stakeholders in the risk review sessions. You have the risk review frequency. It's not like, oh, we have it today. We don't have it in the next two months. So a PMO comes in to ensure that there is a frequency so that there is a consistency on how the risk is being reviewed and managed. And also ensure that for each of the reporting, like the one I mentioned before, there are objectives for the senior stakeholders. What are the type of risks that we wanted to send to them? Do we want to escalate certain number of risks there? And also ensure that there's a minimum standard requirement. So for every risk log that is being set up, there is a minimum standard requirement. And an example of a minimum standard requirement could be something like, we want to ensure that the risk is clearly written in plain English so that people that are not technical, they could go into the log and understand, okay, this is what this risk means. That's an example of a minimum. Or it could be like, every risk must have a mitigation actions and every risk must have a mitigation action owner Mitigation action owner is different from a mitigation, um, a risk owner. So a risk owner could be someone that identified it. And whereas a mitigation action could, owner could be someone that say, okay, these are the possible way for us to reduce this risk. These are the possible way for us to manage it. These are the plans that are put in place and that person is tracking it. So PMO make sure. So some of those things could be the minimum standard requirement for any risk before it's being locked or accepted by the program and um, PMO tend to support in creating this. Uh, the other one is approach for escalating risk and for strategy and direction. So PMO said the approach in terms of how we are escalating our risk, what level of risk do we want to escalate to the senior stakeholders? And yeah, senior stakeholders provide direction and strategy of what needs to be done. We are nearly there, people. Just two more slide. And uh, so this one is just about risk and issues templates I have created. So most of like the question that someone asks, um, they talk about templates. So most of the risk templates they have, I've divided it into three. They have the risk identification, they have the risk impact, and they have the progress updates. And it's similar here to what we have here. So I've, it's just, those are the titles. So the, the identification is saying, what's the status of the risk? Is this still open or is it a closed risk? Who identified it? What, what is a project identifier? So this could be a useful one for a program. So maybe you are a PMO and managing a program and you maintain a, a, program, um, a program risk log. So there you know which of the projects this risk is related to. That's what that project identifier is. Every risk must have a unique risk ID and a risk reference. And then the date the risk was identified, at what stage of the project was this risk identified? Who identified this risk? What was the cost of this risk? Is it related to resources? Is it related to money? Is it related to security? Is it related to environment? Is it related to regulation? And then what are the main impact areas? So if this risk is going to happen, which area in the organization or in the program is this going to impact on? What is the risk tied to? What is the details of this risk? So bringing life to the, defin or the, the risk itself. And then we go to the impact. This is talking about what is this consequences? You can't just say, oh, there's a risk that this is going to happen. And this is the impact. They wanted to understand what is the impact in terms of plain English. This risk, it will happen. We're going to lose 100 million. Or it's going to expose us to branding issue. We're going to have branding issue. We're going to lose customer. We we'll have regulatory issue and all of that. So those are like the risk impact description. Uh, I've already described the inherent risk and um, so inherent risk is before you apply the mitigation actions. And this has always been uh, mentioned in each, at the beginning when they are raising the risk. So there's inherent risk likelihood, there's inherent risk impact or severity. And this is multiplied together to give you a risk score. Uh, some organizations tend to assign value in terms of money to their risk impact. So they will say, what is the cost impact? 
like a fine now or a branding issue, that's going to be a very big cost impact in terms of them going back and rebranding. So some of them tend to want to understand what it is. And that sometimes help them to want to decide, okay, is this a big risk that we need to escalate to the senior stakeholders for support and for, um, for direction? So they tend to put that cost impact. The other one is uh, mitigation actions. So it could be written as mitigation action plan. What are the steps that we need to take to make sure that we are reducing this risk or we are tolerating this risk or we are avoiding this risk or we are transferring this risk? what date was that mitigation action documented? Who is a risk mitigation owner? So that's the mitigation person who is tracking this and making sure that even all of these steps, as you have mentioned it, who is taking ownership of it? There should be an ownership for most of these things. Um, residual risk likely with an impact. I've explained it to us before. So this is after your mitigation. What is it? Has it reduced the risk? and what is the level in terms of scoring and the impact. Um, the last bit is the progress update. This is talking about, is this risk related to an activity in the plan? Do we have it referenced in the project plan? And you put a project plan and reference there. Do we have it referenced? Is it related to a change that is being, do we need to introduce a change because we identify this risk? Uh, yeah, so, uh, that's the change register reference. If the risk is linked to any changes that has been happening in the project, or if it's list, if it's linked to a, a a a tax in the project plan, you have these two references there. And then this is like a regular um ref, regular update comments every sessions that you have your risk updates of what happened or what is going on with the risk. Um, this is like risk. Is it realized or yes or no? No, it's not realized. And then you keep managing it. Uh, all of this are self-explanatory. Last updated dates, just to show that it's being tracked regularly. And then when next are we reviewing it? Did the date of the status change? Maybe the risk is closed from open. When was this done? This is a, a big one, but some company might not want to have their own template in this form. They might want to have it reduced like, very, very simple, few types of different risk. And the date it was closed and the sign of all that. Uh, the next is the, so I've mentioned about radio, which is talking about risk log, assumption, issues, dependency, decision, and opportunity log. And assumption log is used like a risk register to capture and track assumption throughout the project risk, and it could become a risk, as I've mentioned before. Assumption logs are quite very simple. Uh, the, the, the ones that I feel that are more, more comprehensive are risk and issue log. Assumption log are quite very simple, just given the reference ID, the project, the title, who is the owner, due date, do we need to make any follow-up action? I'll show us just the live version of it. And the same thing with the decision log as well. And in terms of risk tools, the different tools that are being used, this is depending on the sophisticated, how sophisticated the organization is. So um, some of them use Jira, some use SharePoint, some use Excel, some use Project Online. Project Online is almost similar to Spreadsheet. It's just that it's an online tool and Monday.com. Uh, I would encourage, there are a lot of YouTube uh, videos that you can just watch to see how the risk is being used or uh, tracked or monitored via the Jira or SharePoint tool. And this is almost like our final, yes. This is our final slide before I just show it briefly on that two minutes, um, all the different live version of a risk log and assumption log. So roles and responsibility, what are the roles and responsibility of a PMO analyst or project support person? Someone had already asked this question. So a PMO person is good to have that background knowledge of what risk is, how they assess the risk and how they treat the risk. 
and because that will help you to be able to ship in some recommendations during the risk review sessions. So PMO analysts or project support tend to help to set up the risk agenda, facilitate the whole session, making sure that you have the right risk um, stakeholders in the session, captures the actions during the meeting, circulate it post the session, and chase for updates. Regularly, you have to chase for updates prior to your next meeting and they create reports and ad hoc um, project requests. So someone might say, I wanted to see all the risk related to me. I wanted to see all the risk that rated 10 and above. I wanted to, so PMO tend to support that. Uh, a PMO lead person, they do almost this role, but they help to set the standard. They help to implement a risk management process. So maybe an organization, they already have a risk process, but it's not a coordinated approach. So a PMO lead person will help to implement it and coordinate all of the different project risk review session that is happening. And they facilitate this level of um, risk management. So it wouldn't be at the project level for a PMO lead. It will probably be at the portfolio or directorate level and um, they capture and they train as well so pmo does train pms they are what i meant by this is there are some technical pms or technical project managers that don't understand the project management technology uh, methodologies or approach pmo tend to train and teach on risk management, what is required, especially the minimum standard, PMO tend to emphasize this and train them and explain it to them. And the PMO leaders will also help to escalate top risk. Uh, there's an organization that I work and we escalate risk to Hong Kong. Hong Kong is like the mother company. We have offices in UK, in Thailand, in India and everything, but the top of it is, to Hong Kong, that's like, they are the one that make the say. So PMO tend to coordinate this and the way this will go, the PMO lead, I mean, the way this will be reported to those level of stakeholders is not the same way it's being reported at the project or program level. Thank you. So that's all I have today regarding risk and project management. And uh, I will just use one minute to show us a live, um, risk register so this was the risk register we maintained during the ladder back down session uh it's just um and then it's just a live view of uh what it looks like so this is the risk saying is open the digital migration sorry someone is saying can i see thank you at funke lawal uh someone said can i see what is a project slide again please Oh, well, do you mean the definition of a project at Bola? Yes, I did. Just that slide, because I saw the, the one after it, but I missed the one, that actual one, because I saw the what's a program, but I didn't okay. see the project. Thank you. All right, that's fine. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, so this is a live uh, view of uh, what a risk log would look like. You could see that we have... The way I showed it in the PowerPoint slide, we have is been divided into the areas of identification, and that talks about everything I've explained before. What phase is a project? Who identify the dates and all of that? Is this caused by governance, dependencies, resourcing, and then what is the impact area? So all of this is here, and then you see this is our residual and sorry our inherent risk. We did not put a cost to it because. We didn't know this is like ladder back down project uh so we left that but it shows you uh pmo this is where you need some skills in terms of excel you need to know how to use some excels you don't have to be a master but you can along the way learn how to use it because you might have to be doing some form of uh, data validation some form of conditional formatting in your um when you're using this type of in when you're using this type of um spreadsheet but if it is in that's a risk log you're using spreadsheet but if it is in jira or if it's in sharepoint you don't need to worry about this 
you just need to select set it up if you know how to use SharePoint and just put the color coding thing there to say you wanted to have this color. Uh, at another session, maybe individual, anybody later, later, I can show how to do the SharePoint one. And yeah, the residual risk call and the different updates, progress updates that shows a plan, how it's been done. Do we have any plan then and all of that? Or uh, any associated risk register? That is that on the risk log. And this is what I have for the assumption log. Assumption log is very basic and simple. Who raised it? Is it valid? So you just have to do, this is your data validation. If it's invalid, you make it red. Uh, that is it from me. Thank you, everyone. Oh, yes, I'm just going to go back to your request regarding the project slide. So at Bola, this is um, the oh, slide. Uh, yeah, uh, what about what is what is a program? <laughs> Thank oh, you. program is a combination of them. That's the one. Okay, I program. Thank you. <laughs> oh, program is a combination of multiple projects achieving the same objective, having one objective to be done. In terms of slides, um, I think the video might will be shared, but slide would not be shared because slide is still work in progress with all the other ones. That's correct. And um, yeah, the video will be ready later on today or on Monday. Um, is that, Kenny, uh, Mary, is that the end of today's session? Have you, advised yes, them how many, have you advised them how many sessions there will be for the training? Um, I haven't advised in terms of different sessions. Originally, we have three sessions. But with the look of things, it depends. So this is the reason I wanted to understand the audience so that I would know yeah. de how detailed I should go in or how it should be very, um, how detailed it should be or just a day. I have, I have different slides on um, change management. I could just talk about it and all of our finance and all of that. But engagement with the with the team because I could see that there are a lot of people that are new and so it would probably take more than three sessions. We'll probably do like four or five sessions. Okay. Because I wanted to cover all of these areas of specialization, this PMO area of specialization as much as I can. But the big one is usually this all of them are actually big anyway. It depends on the organization. Okay. Okay. So thank you, everyone. I'll stop sharing now. Oh, I don't know if you have any question. That's amazing. Um, questions, questions before we end today's session. Can I ask and one if you question? want us to, if you still want this to continue, can you please let us know? Because we know that we can't grab everything in Mary's head right now uh, in today's session. So could you let us know uh, what your preference are? We might build on this next week or the week after, but if you are all happy about with today's session, then we can just end it today. <laughs> oh no, more sessions are needed, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's one person. Um, there is a question on when is your BA session? And Can you please ask BA questions outside of PMO sessions, please? Thank you. Please, can, can I ask a question? Yes, please. So those um, red um, templates that you showed us, is it that the organizations will have their own templates or does the PMO have to you know, create all these templates? all these different templates, like the red uh, one you showed us, the risk <laughs> assumption one. Yeah. It depends it on the maturity of the organization. Some of them would already have, most of them would already have, but some of them don't have. 
So if they don't have, you would need to, another thing I need to mention is this, before you go about creating a template for any organization that you join, even though you notice that they don't have, it's always good to engage with the six stakeholders to understand what they wanted to see in their risk log. So you, if there isn't any, you can create one. And that would be you engaging with the different stakeholders to, um, to understand what they wanted to see. And then you can guide them based on your experience. Or they could have one in existence, but you could help them to brush it up, maybe bring it to life and say, okay, do you have, um, uh, do you have a risk log? Or if they don't have a risk log, another document when you join an organization is called governance framework or investment framework. This is how the, if they have it, how they decided that they want to deliver their projects. So there is a governance, everything including race, including stage, everything I've listed here is always included in that governance framework. There you will be able to see some of the things that you needed to set up a template for your risk log. But you should engage with the stakeholders before you can create one, if there isn't any to understand what they wanted. Thank you. Hi, hi. Sorry, I, I've got two questions. Um, mm -hmm. One is, um, oh, I cannot lost. Okay, the first one is, I'm just wondering how we can join the Ladderback um, Telegram group. And then, secondly, um, I know you mentioned um, you mentioned um, a project was done within the group um, sometime last year. Is there going to be another project? Uh, I will leave a statement to answer that question. In terms of, I don't know if there's any, there is, anyway, I'll leave her to answer the okay, question. I'll ask the question again. If it has anything to do with the BA session, can you please not, ask on the group? No, it's about the P, um, PMO session. Right. So the question is, so the first question is, how do you join the yeah, ladder yeah. back down group? Right. Right. The ladder background group is no longer being run as the ladder background group. Now okay. we have different sessions, different groups for B, uh, VAs, PMOs, PMs, cybersecurity, and the rest of them. So it's up to you right. which ones you want to join. And if you want to do that, can you please send a WhatsApp uh, message to 044 I'll put it in oh, the. Is that Timmy's number? That's not Timmy's number. That's Black and, Black and Scott's number. Oh, okay. Well, okay, I'm going to add it to the comments here. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay. Kind of said okay. And then the second question was, during the presentation, um, she mentioned a project that was done last year. Is there something similar going to be done again? No. No, okay. Oh, yeah, but we have, there's a live project still. Yeah, okay. there's a live project that is going on, and mm -hmm. it's for, uh, it's already... It's been going on for over three months. We, okay. are, we are starting the sprints sometime in the next couple of days. The BAs, of, uh, the POs, the BAs, they've understood the requirement for the sessions. They are going to be delivering the user stories, acceptance criteria. The technical team are already setting up the, uh, they've set up the sandbox for the project. So it's going on. Okay. I'm not sure what you want to know about that. Uh, oh, no. So is it, is it too late to join it or? Um, can you send a number, a message to that number, 0744224 It's okay, in the chat box. I don't want to bring yeah. something else that is outside of this session to this session. That's fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Any other question relating to the PMO session this afternoon? Uh, uh, hello. Um, okay. Um, are we going to be doing some, you know, like um, practical side to this, to the to the theory? Is there going to be like any practical side to it? Do you understand? The only way to have a practical session will be if you're in a live project. That's the only way you can see how it is done and what is being done. Okay, is there going to be any live projects on this group or do we, we have, have a live project going on at the moment? Let's have 
I understand your concerns. I understand the concerns of people when they go for trainings, they want to see how it's done at work so that they can apply their, themselves when they get to work. It's important to me as well that we don't just uh, tell, we will show. And that is why we have a, an ongoing project at the moment. What I have discussed with Mary uh, a couple of days ago was that we would need her to come in with our expertise and set up and guide on the, running the PMO for that pro project. Now, she's busy. I'm not sure how much time she can put into that. If it is something that she will put, we'll let you know at the next session. If it is something that she can join and put uh, the structure in place for that project, then you guys can come on to that project. We meet every Thursday at 6 p.m. and then have a, night, uh, have a look at what she does or how she's putting everyone through to put the structure in place. If that is not going to be so, we will find a way to show you what is done. I appreciate that, but then again, Mary is a busy person. She's uh, <laughs> she's wearing a few hats and um, getting her to come into this session was a hard task. So asking her additional will be something that she would have to confirm herself. So I'll ask her behind the scenes and let you guys know if that is okay. Thank you. Thank you. What we can do is um, um, we do have a PMO group on Telegram. You all can join if you have not joined and she can be sharing some practical tips if she's not going to be available. But I will share the link for you to join, or you can join, and then we can take it from there. If she's still able to join the live project, then that'll be brilliant. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Welcome. Any other question? Just to... This is supposed to be for an hour, but you guys have taken our time. I uh, know, I enjoyed this actually. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that one hour might not be, you know, I, I, I don't I, want I, to talk too much. So. <laughs> Thank you for staying truth with us to the end of this session. Mm -hmm. We hope to see you in the future sessions as well. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the next session, if it's going to hold, and if you guys can just uh, go off mute and let us know if you are attending next Saturday, same time at noon. Can you let us know? Otherwise, we'll have to end it today. If you are attending next Saturday, can you unmute yourself and say, let us have a, a yes or a no? So that yes. we can. Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Say yes, the yes. Okay. Yes, please. Yes, please. Fantastic. Okay, so that's amazing. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> yes, please. Okay, okay. So the yeses are more than, I haven't heard any no. So that means we're meeting it tomorrow and next Saturday at noon. Yes. Fantastic. That'll so now the next step will be, um, can you check through the chat box or I type it again? I'll just, I don't know why Telegram is not firing up for me and I don't want to install anything again. Um, 0744224751. I'm not talking about BA. It's so simple. I'm not talking about anything BA today. This is PMO. There is a BA group. Just send a text message to that number. Everybody wants to be a BA. 079-074-424-7540. I'm going to put it here. 074-424-7510. Please just send um, a message to that um, WhatsApp number. Uh, what's up message to that number i will add you to the pmo group and you can ask your questions and then we will announce next steps for for the um, next if you're going to have any project life project or maybe we'll have a think about it and see how she can show you the hands-on session is that okay and to everyone that have joined outside of the united kingdom i celebrate you i really appreciate your time. I know some people have joined in from the States, Canada, from Nigeria. Wow. Can the Nigerian people say hello? <laughs> just wanted to see Nigeria. Oh, thank you. Oh, if you're from Nigeria, just unmute yourself and let us know if you are here. Okay, blessing. David said hello. Okay. Hello. Uh, 
Oh, do not. Oh, take thank you. Wow. wow. Anyone from Canada? No. Okay, maybe it's dropped off. Uh, the United States. Uh, no. So everybody is from the UK. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. You probably couldn't make it. So we'll see you again next week, Saturday at noon. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you so very much. You guys have been an amazing audience. We appreciate you. Again, spread the word. This is um, Black and Scott. We are here to support. We're here to help. And we are a non-profit. Um, we are not asking you to pay for these sessions. And we are not charging for this particular session. There will be sessions that you're going to be charged. And we will advise you in the future. It depends if we get someone that is not available for free. So keep praying for us and we'll be praying for you too. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Wish you all the Thank best. You. And see Thank you very much. Right. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Thanks Mary. Mary. Bye. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye. Bye. Thank Mary's you. Amazing. Thank you. I see a lot of few Scottish faces here. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> Thank see you ya. very much. Bye. See ya. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank God you. Bless. Bye. Bye. Very well done. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. So you. Much, Mary. And now Thank my you. phone is ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing. If I haven't you. even got off the call. They're already calling my phone. <laughs> is it a call? Or is it meant to be a call or a message? It was supposed to be a message, but some people are calling. Oh. Okay, for people who are, are looking for jobs. You're I still recording it, Joseph. Okay, let me stop recording. Thank you. If you're looking for a job, I don't know what you want me to do about this job.